causation and how the trial judge conflated standard of care with causation in his negligence analysis. Upon these submissions, I will then pass it over to my co-counsel, Ms. DeLuca, who will then discuss our third and fourth submission. Burden of proof is on the plaintiff for non-negligent causes and standard of review is the standard of correctness. Respectfully, the trial judge erred in imposing a standard of care on the respondent, Dr. Ward, based on the absolute result of the surgery outcomes and based on standard of perfection. All evidence suggested that Dr. Ward was complying with the standard of care and taking necessary precautions to ensure that he was several centimeters away from the ureter. On February 5th, Dr. Ward, who was a general surgeon at the Royal Victoria Hospital, carried out a colectomy on Ms. Armstrong. The surgery was not a straightforward procedure as it involved removing Ms. Armstrong's entire colonic structure. This includes the left, right, and transverse colon. The surgery involved several steps, including inserting a laparoscopic port into the left side of the body so that surgery could be performed on the right side, mobilizing the right colon by dividing the peritoneum and performing a dissection to push the colon into the appropriate place, once the colon was mobilized, inserting laparoscopic ports of the abdomen to perform the remainder of the surgery on the left side. Prior to mobilizing the remaining colonic structures, Dr. Ward had to identify the ureter and blood supply movement. Once the ureter had um, disappeared open and opening using the ligature, Dr. Ward had to check and keep rechecking where the ureter was when dissecting into other tissues around the ureter. Following the surgery, Ms. Armstrong attended upon Mr. Ward on three occasions between February and March 2010, with no serious or concerning issues other than discomfort. Approximately 10 weeks after the surgery, Ms. Armstrong reattended upon Dr. Ward, who identified an obstruction to her left ureter. Dr. Hartsburg performed a nephrectomy, which is the removal of kidney. However, tried to follow the ureter down, but stated there were sources of scarring and no mention of thermal injury. Though damages were settled in advance to, advance to the trial, the issue at trial was standard of care and causation. However, in regard to standard of care, the trial judge made a series of compelling errors in deciding that Dr. Ward breached the standard of care and caused injury to Ms. Armstrong's ureter. The trial judge combined the assessment of standard of care issues with causation analysis. This error allowed the trial judge to work backwards rather than to first define what standard of care was to establish a breach and then determine the causation to the breach. He unfortunately accepted the evidence of Ms. Armstrong that an injury that occurs would be a breach of standard of care, which consequently resulted in Ms. Armstrong's injury. By starting with the causation analysis, the trial judge reason was based on hindsight and results to impose that a standard of care equated to perfection. This is an error. The correct approach to determine whether a surgeon acted reasonably is in the technique employed is to identify and protect the ureter, which was not used in the assessment of the breach. However, when identification protections were considered, the trial judge was satisfied that Dr. Ward met these standards. However, because the trial judge infused the definition of standard of care with his determination causing the injury, an error was found in the breach. The Court of Appeal, correctly reversed this decision, affirming that medical negligence law must appropriately establish and define what standard of care is and identify the breach first. This was a complex surgical process with a known risk of uretic injury. The trial judge solely relying on the injury itself led him to determine based on results and improper reasoning. This was correctly reversed by the Court of Appeal. So standard of care has been established for years. With respect to standard of care by Ms. Armstrong, there is no issue that can accurately reflect the Canadian law. There are three essential principles for standard of care. First, standard of care is re of reasonableness in light of medical practitioners and practice guidelines. The standard of care does not equate to perfection and standard of care cannot involve insight. It should be noted that surgery sorry, counsel, completed- can you repeat with that one, last point? The third of the three? Um, standard of care cannot involve hindsight. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It should be noted that the surgery completed was one that was very complex. 
The Honorable Court in Critz v. Sylvester affirmed that every med medical practitioner must exercise a reasonable degree of care. He is bound to exercise that degree of care and skill, which could be reasonably expected from a normal prudent practitioner of the same standing and experience. Elements of negligence analysis. Counsel, excuse me, sorry. I've heard you say a couple of times already that the procedure was complex. Is that right? Yes, complex. You, and, sorry. Just. Are you relying on any evidence from the trial record to say that it was complex? Complex in the sense where Dr. Word stated, like, in order to um, follow guidelines and follow the practices, there are necessary precautions to take place to identify where the ureter is, stand back. In that sense, there are a lot of steps to take in before doing the procedure, surgical what, procedure. What do you make of the evidence from the expert witnesses at trial who testified that this was a, a relatively standard procedure for a general surgeon? Yes, yeah, so that's Dr. Bernstein's uh, test um, statement. And Dr. Bernstein does not perform laparoscopic colectomies and his opinion is on the standard of care required for perfection. And I believe his opinion was inconsistent with authoritative medical literature. With, um, with respect to Dr. Ward, who did perform various, um, used ligatures various times to perform laparoscopic colectomy, there are various steps he had to take and he identifies this as a complex procedure in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. So currently the laws have adopted and affirmed a view that standard of care will be reasonably competent. Meeting the standard of care does not imply meeting perfection. In Carlson versus Sutherland, the courts overturned a trial judge's decision on the basis that imposing a standard of excellence that amounted to perfection was impossible to contradict. Finally, Hinsight demonstrated that assessing standard of care and subsequent cases highlighted practitioners cannot be judged based on the results, rather the judge Rather, judge must distinguish negligence and breach of standard of care. By determining causation and reordering the negligence, negligence analysis was incorrect by law and determined the doctor was at fault for Ms. Armstrong's injury. Counsel. So, yeah. No, no. Go, go ahead, Justice. Go ahead, Justice, please. Um, I, I know that you've repeatedly said that you can't use hindsight to determine standard of care. Is it ever appropriate to look at what happened to inform the standard of care analysis? So there may be situations where when an injury is directly causing, so let's say Dr. Word cut out, cut Ms. Armstrong's leg, like that was direct. And even if he was following standard of care practices, that was not Factually speaking, like for the facts of this case, he was doing the surgery that he was required to do and following these steps. However, if he was doing something outside of the facts of these cases, I think you may be able to analyze causation before finding a breach. But because medical procedures are kind of like professional, professional standards that should be followed, I don't think for this case with the facts stated that it makes sense to look at causation first before finding a breach, if that answers your question. And, and so, so counsel, that I have a question just following up uh, on my friend's uh, question from the bench. Uh, I, what I'm having the most difficulty understanding is how do I reconcile your position that causation or an analysis of causation as performed by the trial judge was effectively using hindsight to inform the standard of care, while at the same time, I believe it's your position that it's the plaintiff's responsibility to rule out non-negligent causes of this potential issue. Um, and that, that's the difficulty I'm having is reconciling those two positions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can help me out. If you're gonna get there in your submissions, I'm happy to, to hear about that in the context of your submissions. But for me, uh, sitting here, that's, that's the difficulty I'm having overall, I think, on the issues that I think you indicated uh, initially that you would be speaking about. So if you can turn your mind to those two things as you continue, uh, that'd be helpful. Yes, thank you, Justice. Um, I will be talking about causation and using the buffer analysis as well. So um, in that case, um, I will continue on with my submission for causation and my co-counsel will talk about not for negligence costs. 
So factually speaking, Ms. Dr. Ward did stay one to two millimeters away from the um, ureter the entire time, and he did meet the standard of care that he testified, and these were the steps that are not the outcome. Regarding causation, Ms. Armstrong experienced a blocked ureter. That does not mean Dr. Ward's surgery was the cause of the injury, nor does it mean it was, he was negligent. Causation being established is where the plaintiff proves beyond balance of probabilities. The evidence provided by Dr. Klotz indicated that something less than an acute rupture could have occurred if the ligature was in close proximity to the ureter. Examples include necrosis or thermal injury. However, causation was not established if the procedure contributed to the specific injury. The presence of the injury does not prove causations on the balance of probability in the sense where the butt test was used as a general test. However, it's not a conclusive test because this test should only be used when a breach is established. And because a breach was not established, the test, a causation wasn't proved beyond, on a balance of probabilities. And determining that causation was a critical legal error. So there were substantial evidence on record to demonstrate that the causation theory brought forward by my friends were not credible. Specifically, upon surgery, expected symptoms such as leakage of urine and formation of urinoma and symptoms of progressive abdominal pain and, ele and elevated white blood cells, cell count and fever days after the surgery were possible, were not present in this case. Sorry, were not present in this case. And Dr. Hatzberg's operative report made no mention that Ms. Armstrong's ureter had suffered a thermal injury and instead noted that the scarring occurred actually quite time after the surgery. So Dr. Hatzberg's operative note also highlighted a significant degree of hersions and scarring following the nephrectomy. And once again, there were no reference to thermal injury. But counsel, doesn't that just show that the, uh, uh, that the injury wasn't, that the ureter wasn't touched necessarily by the uh, uh, ligament, but that there still it still could have been within one to two millimeters uh, away from it, causing thermal. Uh, um, thermal so, thank you, um, thank you, Justice. So, um, Doctor Ward, there were um, was working with the tissues around. He did stay. He was um, he did stay. He was five to fifteen centimeters away from the ureter, and two millimeters is can be just small as this while five to 15 centimeters on eyeball was around there. So there's a huge difference between that from where he was standing from the ureter. So in this case, um, there was no breach in his practice. And so his, there couldn't have been a causation established from what he was performing through his practice guidelines. Uh, counsel, one question on that point is, are the respondents, um, uh, disputing, I think, the evidence found by the trial judge that uh, uh, the physician lost sight of the ureter or was not able to see his relationship to the ureter at certain points in time during the procedure? No, that's not. The, so those were not in the trial judge's analysis. So that, that wasn't in evidence? That wasn't in evidence. Okay. So Thank this you. is a matter of more like, did he follow his practice guidelines of standard of care breach? No, and I, I, I under, yeah, I understand that that the the issue is whether he followed mm -hmm. um, standard of care guidelines in terms of the steps, the necessary steps to to perform as part of this procedure. My recollection, uh, and perhaps my fellow justices can assist me if I'm incorrect, but my recollection was that there was a was an uh, an admission uh, or finding that uh, the surgeon was unable to see or lost sight of the ureter at points in time in, this, in, in the procedure and therefore could not state during those points in time whether he was, what his proximity to the ureter was. Okay, so I see what you're saying. So the laparoscopic um, camera when inserting, when it is being used, sometimes it doesn't allow you to view the ureter as well. And this is very common when using laparoscopic, um, when performing laparoscopic surgery. So okay. when you are standing away, you won't be able to identify the ureter at all times. Okay, so it's your position that in, in, in those moments that is a expected uh, part of the procedure and there is no breach in the standard of care uh, resulting from that or were there no requirements to do anything different than Mr. Ward did? Yes, correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, that you. concludes the 15 minutes.
I'm uh, 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 I was going to suggest registrar. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think the court would like to hear for an additional three minutes from from our uh, uh, esteemed counsel here. If that's okay with the Thank only with the moderator. Much. Yes. Thank you, justices. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so there are material inconsistencies between Dr. Bernstein's evidence and Dr. Quilt's evidence. Dr. Bernstein did testify in cross-examination that if Dr. Ward was four millimeters away from the ureter, as opposed to one to two millimeters away, he could not have injured the ureter. Dr. Quilt's testified that the scar tissue could have been formed in the surrounding tissues to the ureter. In Hank versus Research, Fisk Corporation, the, um, the but-for test recognizes that compensation for negligent conduct should only be made where substantial connection between the injury and defendant's conduct is present. This ensures that a defendant will not be held liable for plaintiff's inju injury where they may very well be due to factors unconnected to the defendant and not at the fault of anyone. So I have explained my view why trial judges erred in the standard of care and causation analysis in imposing liability for Dr. Ward. I conclude by stating that the standard of care was met by Dr. Ward and his testimony ought to be taken into account. Additionally, the causation was not established nor proved by the evidence provided by my friends. Thank you, your justices. These are my submissions. I will now pass it over to my co-counsel, Ms. DeLuca, to make her submissions. Before you do, counsel, I have a brief question, uh, and this will apply and hopefully be addressed by your co-counsel. Are you saying that the finding of fact by the trial court that um, Dr. Ward did come within two, one or two millimeters of the ureter was incorrect, that that finding of fact was in error? Um, so can you repeat that? I, I, so missed I, part of the question. I understood you to be saying, counsel, that the reason that Dr. War was not negligent is that the doctor did not come within one to two millimeters of the ureter. Yes. Okay. And so the question that I'm going to have for your co-counsel when she uh, takes the floor is whether there's a different standard of care that has to be applied in light of that submission. Um, okay, thank you, Justice. I will pass it over to my co-counsel. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I beg your pardon. I said Ms. standard of care. I meant standard of review. I standard. Me. Yes. Okay. Uh, Miss Miss Deluca, before you get started, I just want to make sure that I have the correct materials in front of me as I listen to your submissions. I've just um, I, I, what I should I have in front of me a factum? That is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I, yeah, and I've, I've just got, I understand your counsel response. The factum I have says factum of the appellant. I am just wanted to uh, make sure I have the right fact. Is that a, just a typographical error? Um, is it for team 14? It is for team 14. Um, I just wanted to point that I'm just not sure. Um, I, I just want to make sure that I have the correct materials in front of me. It appears that I do. Um, but um, yeah, and, and just going forward, if there's any other materials or any, any cases, just please uh, let me know what they are and I'll, I'll make sure that I have them in front of me. Thank you, Justice, we will. Thank you. So thank you to my co-counsel, Ms. Baskaraja, for our opening remarks. And thank you, Justices of the Court. Good morning, everyone. I have three main points that I would like to discuss with you today. First, whether the plaintiff has a duty to rule out non-negligent causes. So yes, uh, we would agree that it is the plaintiff's duty to rule out non-negligent causes in this case. Second, whether the majority erred in applying correctness standard of review. And if so, what was the appropriate standard of review it ought to have applied? Uh, so the trial court was an error in law and the appropriate standard uh, review in this case is correctness. Um, so I will get into that a little bit more and uh, answer the justice's question at that time. And then finally, my third point, I will uh, end off with some concluding remarks for today. Uh, so I'd like to start out just by addressing whether the plaintiff has a duty to rule out non-negligent causes in this case. Um, so non-negligent causes should be ruled out if their argument claims that negligence was the only cause of injury. So this was the obiter in the Court of Appeals decision. 
As stated by the majority from the Court of Appeal, a trial judge who is prepared to proceed on the basis that only negligence could cause the relevant injury is obliged to consider and rule out non-negligent causes. So when they're defining standard of care in this way, the plaintiff needs to rule out the non-negligent causes. It's their obligation if they are framing the argument as negligence is the only reason uh, that this could have happened to Ms. Armstrong. The majority reason that more needed to be discussed in terms of accidental causes of injury in the Court of Appeals decision uh, because this was not addressed in the trial judge's decision and there was an insufficiency of evidence as a result. For example, alternatives to negligence and unintentional factors beyond the scope of a reasonable doctor. Indicating that all injuries must be the result of negligence does not follow unless other reasons have been ruled out. Uh, counsel, um, on that point, is there any obligation on the doctor to establish a evidentiary foundation for other causes of negligence, or uh, is it the obligation um, on the, uh, the plaintiff to rule out any possible um, other cause of the injury? Thank you for your question, Justice. Uh, so to answer your question, um, it's not the defendant's responsibility to rule out non-negligent causes because there wasn't a breach. So in medical malpractice, we're looking at what was the reasonable doctor expected in this situation? Did the reasonable doctor follow the steps? And all evidence provided, um, as my co-counsel so eloquently put out, uh, that Dr. Ward was always within five to 15 centimeters of the ureter. Um, and Dr. Ward testified to that. Uh, so from that, uh, Dr. Ward took all of the reasonable steps and, and that's what we expect when we are uh, assessing uh, the conduct of our doctors. Um, simply having an outcome of an injury does not mean that Dr. Ward acted uh, negligently in the procedure. We're focused on the steps and, uh, and the steps uh, indicate that Dr. Ward uh, followed the procedure appropriately. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just continue with uh, my uh, arguments here. Uh, so Dr. Robinette, uh, urologist, uh, testified that if the ureter was in fact injured by thermal energy, Ms. Armstrong's symptoms would have manifested much differently. Um, so Dr. Robinette uh, discusses that uh, Ms. Armstrong would have developed these symptoms a few days after the colectomy and not several weeks or months afterward as uh, what occurred with Ms. Armstrong. In supporting a case where only negligence could have resulted in injury, the appellant would need to suggest that this case had exceptional circumstances. And this case was not exceptional. And even if it were, the burden would still be on the plaintiff to rule out accidental causes uh, for injury. Uh, there was no evidence provided indicating that negligence could have been the only cause, especially when the trial judge found that Dr. Ward acted reasonably. So this was in the trial judge's decision. And even Dr. Bernstein agreed that Dr. Ward took the reasonable steps. It was Dr. Bernstein's conclusion that it was thermal energy, but I would like to point out respectfully that Dr. Bernstein does not perform uh, laparoscopic procedures. Uh, so laparoscopic procedures um, involving the ligature machine, they're less invasive uh, than the open procedures that Dr. Uh, Bernstein performs. Counsel, with respect, that wasn't my understanding of the trial judge's finding that all steps were were followed reasonably. My understanding from the trial judge's decision was that the, the final step of ensuring that uh, the surgeon didn't come within one to two millimeters of the ureter was not followed. Isn't that correct? Thank you, uh, Justice, for your question. Um, so uh, to, to answer your question with that, um, as my co-counsel also uh, uh, previously discussed, um, so with the laparoscopic procedure with the ligature, um, the ureter will not 100% be in view at all times. So this, this is a known fact when uh, performing these uh, laparoscopic procedures. Um, but that does not mean that Dr. Ward acted negligently uh, because he couldn't see 
uh, the ureter 100% of the time. And uh, Dr. Ward testified that he was always five to 15 centimeters away. That's a significant difference. Um, and I know that Dr. Ward did not have a ruler. I do have a ruler here. And I would just like to point out how substantial that difference really is. So when we're looking at one to two millimeters, you can barely see it here just where, with this hand. You can barely see where one to two millimeters is. It's very, very small. And Dr. Ward testified that he was always five, so using this hand, he was always five to 15 centimeters away from the ureter. So this was Dr. Ward's testimony. And- uh, oh, I'm sorry, counsel, square those two things with me. You just said that uh, it was inevitable that Dr. Ward would lose sight of what he, he was doing, this, the surgery that he was performing, but was also able to testify with certainty and, and um, we should accept that um, he was able to determine that he was at all times between five to 15 centimeters. So how does that square with your earlier submission that it was inevitable that, that the doctor would have lost sight of the procedure? Um, so that really just squares together because with this procedure, it's, it's inevitable, yes, that he won't always see the ureter. Um, but in his testimony, he claims he was always 5 to 15 centimeters away. So that, given his experience with this procedure, um, I think it, it would not be fair to Dr. Ward to say that um, he's perjuring himself. Uh, by saying that, um, I would uh, take his testimony to mean that uh, with reasonableness, with his uh, taking his competency into account, that um, he's confident that he was always 5 to 15 centimeters away, regardless of whether or not um, it was 100% in view at all times. And I think what this really comes down to is which experts are we, are we going to uh, believe in this case? Uh, because with that testimony, um, you know, coming to light that Dr. Ward was always five to 15 centimeters, it shows he was taking the reasonable steps of a prudent doctor. And just because Ms. Armstrong had this unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate um, outcome injury that uh, happened several months afterward, it doesn't mean that Dr. Ward acted negligently in the procedure. Counsel, is it possible for Dr. Ward to have um, held the ligature within one to two millimeters of the ureter and still not been negligent? So would it have been possible to be one to two millimeters and still not be negligent? I think what we're really looking for is whether or not Dr. Ward took all of the reasonable steps that were expected of him in this procedure. And given Dr. Ward's experience um, as a surgeon performing laparoscopic colectomies, um, and given what we know that he took appropriate steps in his report afterward, there was no indication that there was thermal injury to Ms. Armstrong's ureter. So all of the evidence that we have indicates that Dr. Ward took the reasonable steps expected of him um, as a surgeon performing this procedure. Counsel, and I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. I think, I think my colleague's uh, question on that point is really, is the position of the respondents that maintaining that one to two millimeter distance was a necessary step as part of this procedure, a, a, a step that if violated is clearly a violation of the standard of care, or is it, is it the position that the standard of care could have still been met despite breaching that one to two millimeter distance. I think that's what my colleague was getting at as opposed to the evidentiary foundation for that issue. Or, are we, or, or is it simply the position of, uh, of the respondents that that is a, for lack of a better term, an objective uh, or something that is to be aspired to, but again, that would fall within the sort of perfection type of standard that you guys have articulated or is it something that is necessary? Yeah, so um, just to answer that question, is the one to two millimeters something that is always required? Well, I mean, given the laparoscopic procedure, we can't always 100% see, um, you know, if we are indeed one to two uh, millimeters, I would say it's something more to be aspired to. And Dr. Ward testified that he was always five to 15 centimeters away. 
So I think from that, uh, we can uh, agree that uh, he took the reasonable steps that were expected of him in this procedure. I think in order to um, sort of answer that question in more detail, we would really need to look into um, you know, what, uh, what the exact steps are of this procedure and if that is indeed one of the steps um, that well, uh, required. And, and counsel, I don't mean to cut you off. I, I believe that's what, there is expert evidence that suggests that that is a necessary part of the procedure, that that, that, is, a, that is a threshold which cannot be violated and still maintain the standard of care ex, uh, expected of a, um, of a of a surgeon in like circumstances. I want to make sure, though, that you get to uh, tell us about the standard of uh, review because I think that's an important part of this case. I believe you're going to make some submissions on that. Um, uh, perhaps the moderator uh, might preemptively uh, provide some extra time uh, for this order, and sh uh, she can continue with that submission unless my colleagues have any other questions on this point. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. So maybe you can you can continue. I understand. I think I understand your position uh, on that point, and and uh, I'm at least satisfied that I understand it. But perhaps we can hear about the uh, standard of review. Yeah. Thank you, Justice. Um, I'd just like to to conclude um, my my first point there. Um, so just to conclude very briefly, the low risk of damaging the ureter does not mean that the actions of Dr. Ward were negligent. An error in logic would result that if we inferred the negligence from the low probability of injury. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Ward testified he always kept at least five to 15 centimeters away from the ureter. Um, so moving on to uh, the next point, whether the majority erred in applying a correctness uh, standard of review, and if so, what was the appropriate standard of review um, and ought to have applied? Um, so we agree with the with the Court of Appeals uh, review that it is a standard of correctness and and that's because we believe that uh, the trial judge uh, made an error uh, with uh, reviewing the standard of care. So when we're reviewing standards of law, standard of correctness. Um, so we believe that the trial judge um, made standard of care to be something that was perfection instead of assessing Dr. Ward on uh, the reasonableness of uh, of his actions as a surgeon. Uh, so when we are reviewing medical malpractice, we're looking at me medical professionals and assessing based on their reasonableness. So reasonable doctor, prudent doctor. Um, and this is supported in the St. Jean and Mercier uh, decision where the court ruled that surgeons have an obligation of means and uh, not results or outcomes. So the trial court made an error in applying the standard of care which the Court of Appeal corrected. So the trial court took standard of care to be outcomes-based instead of reviewing if Dr. Ward acted as a reasonable doctor. Uh, so counsel, sorry um, to interrupt, but this is a case in which the facts really are intermingled with how we are supposed to analyze the law. Um, and in that case, as we are sitting as an appellate court, shouldn't we be giving deference to the trial judge's findings of fact and in terms of how it informs, therefore, you know, our analysis? Because this is a complex, relatively complex case in which the facts are really driving the outcomes. Thank you for your question, Justice. Um, yes, I can see where you're coming from in terms of assessing uh, the facts. Um, and um, just to briefly answer that, we, we don't have enough facts that um, we don't have enough facts to, to assess. So our focus um, in answering this question is, was the standard of care applied correctly? Because if it wasn't applied correctly, then there was no breach. Um, so standard of care in the trial uh, judge's decision um, was a matter of assessing whether or not Dr. Ward performed everything perfectly. And, and this certainly is not the standard that we would like to hold our doctors to, whether or not um, you know, everyone heals absolutely 100%. That, that's not realistic. Uh, we need to look at whether or not Dr. Ward uh, performed and took the, the appropriate steps in the procedure. So that was the major error uh, that, uh, that we found from uh, the trial decision. So that's 
that's what we uh, we are focusing on here in, in our submissions today. Yeah, and and can, also, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to, to follow up on the point that I made to your co-counsel earlier. Aren't you also stating that the trial judge made an error in applying or apprehending the facts that um, the doctor did not stay um, five to 10 centimeters or five to 15 centimeters away at all times, as you've said repeatedly? Because that, that's not what the trial court said. Isn't that an Justice, you're on mute. I, I'd love to hear counsel's response. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's a great question in terms of uh, um, assessing that fact. Um, but I think it's not. It's more of a matter of of which expert we're going to believe in this situation. Are we going to really take uh, Dr. Ward's testimony um, that that's what indeed happened? And that's what uh, is that's that a what question of law, counsel? Um, right. So that would, be, that would be, I suppose, more of a question of fact uh, to assess. Uh, but given our time constraints here today, I think um, we wanted to focus more on uh, the, the question of law in this case. And, and counsel, I think the difficulty my, uh, my colleagues are having is that I've heard the bulk of your submissions today. Um, I've heard much argument or at least much uh, submission on the facts and what facts were, um, what was found by the trial judge, what the evidence was both from expert evidence and lay witnesses. And it's difficult for me to reconcile that with a standard of correctness. It sounds to me like the arguments being presented today um, fall within at least a mixed, a question of mixed fact and law, which would have a very different standard. As you know, um, the Court of Appeal would have had a very different standard to apply if that's how they felt about the submissions that they had heard. So that's, that's just my comment on that, but perhaps maybe we'll um, allow you to close up your submission. I'm not sure we have much more time, but let's maybe allow you to close up your submission. And, and if you can address that sort of point, I think that all the justices here have a bit of a concern about, uh, that'd be great. Thank you, Justice. Um, so certainly I can uh, conclude and, and sum up uh, what uh, I've discussed with you today. Um, so just in summing up uh, my first point on whether the plaintiff has a duty to rule out non-negligent causes. So um, as we've uh, discussed, uh, non-negligent causes should be ruled out if their argument claims that negligence was the only cause of injury. Um, and this is because the burden rests on the plaintiff to rule out accidental causes of injury in order for their argument to hold. Um, and yes, we, we did have a, a very important testimony from Dr. Ward that um, he was always a five to 15 centimeters away from the ureter. So this was his uh, coming from his expertise. And this was uh, indicated at uh, paragraph 54 uh, from the trial judge's decision. And then just to sum up uh, my second point, whether the majority erred in applying a correctness standard of review and if so, what was the appropriate standard of review it ought to have applied? Um, so in this case, we would like to just focus on standard of care um, because that's what we believe this case really comes down to is whether or not standard of care was applied appropriately. And because this would uh, um, indicate whether or not Dr. Ward took the appropriate steps. So when we're assessing medical practitioners, um, standard of care is whether or not the medical practitioner performed according to a reasonable doctor. Um, and uh, we believe the Court of Appeal applied that correctly in this case. Uh, uh, so for these reasons, the respondent uh, requests that the Court of Appeal's decision reversing the trial decision is upheld and that these actions uh, are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And I, I, th I think I speak for my colleagues. We thank you for both counsel for their, uh, their helpful submissions. We also thank you for your helpful written materials. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this concludes the matter of Armstrong and Ward. Thank you, respondent. And thank you very much to our justices. Uh, just a reminder to please send in your scorecard. Uh, there's there should be additional instructions um, located in the judge's brief. Uh, the next session will begin at 1130 if you're interested. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, fellow justices. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Thanks okay. so much. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, this session can be ended now, so I will end it for everybody. Okay.